Time for our Monday afternoon panel of political strategists, Graham Morris and Bruce Hawker. Very good afternoon to both of you. The poll, the poll, the poll. It's had everyone talking today. Graham, you first on this one. What, what do you, how do you interpret these numbers? Well, I think, I think the mere fact that the government is really excited and has a spring in its step today and the fact that the polls went up, sheer coincidence. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <related>. Polls don't, <laughs> don't count. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, look, look, look it, it was a huge jump. Um, and you say, well, why? OK, leadership sort of settled. I, I still think there's a bit of a, a Malcolm Turnbull factor in there somewhere. Um, and the fact that the Labor Party's been shut out of everything for a while and sort of don't count. And, and I think that gives you that, that sort of result. But also, you know, just talking to many of the, the troops over the weekend and some this morning, there were many, many coalition backbenchers who were really furious at a couple of their colleagues and a couple of media drongos last week. You know, they've come to Parliament House and saying, hey, we read that there was this bill, but we can't find anybody who's had a phone call. None. And you think, well, and they were a bit grumpy. And they're all essentially saying now, except about half a dozen people who were sharing half a brain, the rest of them are saying, look, we had our vote and in fairness what will happen now and what should happen now is that people do what they said. You give the Prime Minister fair time and really in, in a week or ten days he's, he's gone all right but give him fair time to, to lift the party stock to do what he wants to do and also in fairness to give other challenges times to get themselves organised, they're not organised but the big one the big one is what happens to the party. You know, leaders will come and go, backbenchers will come and go. <coughs> what happens to the party after a, a, a challenge or a leadership change? And I've seen all of these since Fraser and, and Peacock. You know, there's eight, nine, ten of them. And there's a right way of doing it and a wrong way. And the wrong way is if the people who um, were leader and are changed and their supporters feel that was unfair and at the moment any sort of challenge mm -mm. in the near future would be seen as being unfair and the new leader would probably cop a fairly unpleasant time from a few disgruntled well, other people. That, that, that's, that's interesting analysis, but just to, just to um, I guess, defend the drongos uh, who at, at the end of last week were reporting what was going on, I mean, the, the um, reality was that, well, the key was that some of those ministers who were very strongly backing Abbott a few weeks ago were no longer doing so, were in fact arguing that he should go, not saying this week, next week, but, but that, you know, eventually he needs, to, he needs to go. Now, the poll may change things, and you've got to acknowledge uh, that it, it's not helping Tony Abbott to have Julie Bishop, Malcolm Turnbull ask these questions and not ruling out uh, whether they would challenge him. No, I mean, it's not. But there's it's clearly a... consideration going on. No, no, no. But, you know, it's stupid to ask people, hey, will you rule out a challenge forever? It's just, just dumb politics. It doesn't happen anymore. And I actually think, you know, if you look at how Malcolm Turnbull has conducted himself, he's been fine. Hmm. You know, he has done the right, right, right thing. There are a couple of his supporters who are just absolute amateurs. You know, there, there is a professional way of doing this, one where the party comes out united either way. And the way they were heading last week, or what they were talking about, was dis disunity, would bugger the Liberal Party, bugger the government and bugger any new leader. What's the point of that? Bruce, on the poll itself today, what's your interpretation of it? How do you explain the sort of uh, bounce we've seen for the government and for Tony Abbott himself? I think it's very curious, David, and every now and then you do get uh, rogue polls that present a much glowing, much more glowing, but cheerier picture. The news picture. poll showed some tightening as well last yeah, week. it did, uh, and I think there probably is a bit of that. Um, in previous polls when these things have happened, I think it was referred to by one of the Ipsos uh, representatives today, you, when they think that the change is about to happen, people start to acknowledge that the government's doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, everyone's been talking the, uh, in terms of this thing happening immediately. It's all over for uh, Tony Abbott, whereas, you know, I've certainly been saying it's months away. And so it could be that people are actually starting to factor the change in before it actually happens. Um, now, whatever it is, I don't think uh, there's any great comfort in this for either the Liberal Party or for Abbott because <coughs> I think it's a, uh, you know, it's a false dawn 
I don't see anything that's happened in the last month that has done anything to justify that sort of an increase in his personal support or that of the Liberal Party, quite the contrary. So we're likely to see a, a big correction in a month's time. And what that means, of course, in purely practical political terms, is that Luke Foley, the opposition leader in New South Wales, can breathe a little easier because he won't be up against Malcolm Turnbull and Baird at the next election. He'll be up against Tony Abbott and Baird at the next election. And that's a much better situation for him to be in. So the big, uh, the people who would be really cheering about this right now would be down in Sussex Street in Sydney. They'd be very happy <laughs> that uh, this, there is not going to be a change of leader anytime soon. Now, Bruce mentions that uh, not enough or not much is, is changing in terms of uh, the government's policy prescription. But we do know, Graham, uh, the GP co-payment's likely to go this week. They're, they're probably going to do something about the new start changes. Um, there have been various other announcements, whether it's the supermarket code of conduct today, the foreign investment rules last week, and reviews on welfare and childcare out there as well. There's a lot of activity going on. Um, can I ask you about the policy backdowns, though, that we're expecting? How do you perform the uh, the perfect backflip? <laughs> it's never easy on something that you've defended for a 12 bit, months. With a bit of grace and a bit of style. Um, a bit of spin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, uh, the way to explain it is simply um, what they will say. And it's fair income. We have listened. We have genuinely listened. The government tried some difficult things. The electorate wasn't ready for it. Some of the back benches weren't ready for it. The Senate was definitely not going to pass it. So, you know, politics is still sort of the art of the possible. And if you keep banging your head against a brick wall on something that's never going to happen, it's never going to get through the Senate, then why persist? Why not, why not uh, f go and fight on a different area, one where you're just not fighting yourselves? And I think, I, I, I genuinely think that if people can get up and say, we've listened, we've listened to the electorate, we've listened to some of the senators, but we particularly, we the ministers, have listened to our backbench, then, you know, enough people are going to say, oh, I get it, they finally have listened. I imagine, Bruce, Labor won't let them off quite so uh, likely. There'll be a litany of quotes rolled out of the mm. Prime Minister and others uh, arguing why we need a GP co-payment. Mm. And... Uh, <coughs> And, and, and it looks to self-interest then, doesn't it? It just looks like it's, it's based not on the national good but on self-interest. It's about the Prime Minister trying to hang on to the leadership at any cost rather than doing what he said he was going to do a few months ago and that is you know, get the books back into the black and so forth. Uh, it's very, very difficult for him then because he looks hypocritical and those around him look hypocritical. It's, a, you know, it's humiliating for Joe Hockey. All these things uh, really add to an impression which either way you go uh, that you're not fit for the job. Uh, you know, the person who suffered really badly from this was Kevin Rudd back in 2010 when uh, after pushing the emissions trading scheme for so long and running into exactly the same sort of opposition that we've got now in the Senate from the same people, except that it was the Liberals rather than the mm. Labor Party, uh, when he backed away from it, he was absolutely vilified and, uh, and, and, and he really struggled to recover from that. In fact, it was not long after that that he was removed as Prime Minister. So uh, we should not underestimate how difficult this is going to be for the government to try to uh, extricate itself from this mess because that's what it is and then they've got another budget to bring down in the coming months I think you know if I was them I'd be saying well it, you know the economy that we're presiding over is so appalling we've got to start stimulating it rather than tightening it uh, and maybe get out of it that way but that's not a very neat and elegant way of getting out of things either so whatever happens this is not going to be good for them We've only got a minute left. I just want your thoughts too on uh, Labor putting out a policy today on uh, multinationals trying to make them pay more tax in Australia. I won't go through the details of exactly how the thin capitalisation rules would change, Good. but this is obviously a, 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 a soft target. Multinationals should pay more tax. Both sides essentially agree on that, but it's how you make them do it. It's the question. We've already seen business slamming it as a job destroyer. Bruce, I guess this is always the risk of putting out policy so early. I, I don't think this is a, a dangerous one for Labor. They only have to point to you know, the evidence. Uh, Apple, 
on six billion dollars in income in Australia pays 89 million dollars a year. Uh, the same amount of tax is paid by Harvey Norman and they receive a quarter of that income. So Australian companies are paying their fair share, multinationals aren't. I think Bill Shorten can point to this as being uh, a bit of business that's long overdue. And is this a reasonably safe area, do you think, for Labor to start on, Graham? Oh, i got a few other windmills they could tilt at. <laughs> you know, the fact is, some of them are my clients, but the fact is they pay what the law says they should pay. <coughs> and, you know, Australia can't go alone. You know, we've got the Labor Party who's now going to shut down all the islands, shut down America, shut down and, ab and abolish all jobs that to do with accountants and tax law. Good luck. So why is Joe Hockey uh, pursuing a Google tax? Because what he is doing is trying to get the rest of the world to, to play. Australia on its own cannot do this. That's exactly it is an right. international That's, that... an, an international um, thrust and it's the only way to beat this. Otherwise mm. Australia just looks silly and the Labor Party looks dopey. Well, wasn't that what right. the G20 was meant up. to be about? The G20 was meant to be about yeah, that. Well, indeed. We're going to have to move on. We'll catch you both next week, Graham, Bruce. Thanks very much for that. We'll take a break. Back with more on PM Agenda.